Well, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to this fourth of eight presentations by renowned client scientist, Dr. Tom English in his environmental education series. Dr. English has accomplished many things in his rich and varied career, much of it having to do with improving our environment. He was the author of the California Clean Air Act in the late 1980s, which was largely responsible for getting rid of all of the horrible smog that we've suffered back from back then. He's met and collaborated with dignitaries around the world. Uh, he's earned a Congressional Medal of Honor on behalf of the Patriarch Bartholomew for their work together on climate. He has an unusual ability to communicate difficult concepts in very easy to understand ways. And he has a huge passion for educating others on our current climate crisis and the existential threats that it's bringing to all of us and to our children's generations. We all need to be aware of what can be done to counter this. And that's really the goal of this series is to help you uh, more clearly understand what are the main issues behind climate change and what can be done about it so you can have better discussions with family and friends and become more involved. My name is Dave Rice and I'll be your host for the event. So without further ado, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tom English. Welcome, Tom. Well, well, thanks very much, Dave. Uh, it's really, uh, we're about halfway there. Okay, we'll basically skip the questions and get on with the, uh, the cost of carbon here. Okay, all right. So you can see the cost of carbon is, is incredible for a whole lot of things, including some things that we don't really have here, but it goes for loss of our way of life, uh, storm damage. Uh, it goes to actually uh, extinction of humanity, possibly. So it's something we want to avoid. That's for sure. It's the number one threat to the global economy today. So we basically, let's, let's figure out a way to solve this puppy. So this shows you the various sources of, uh, of uh, greenhouse gases, airplanes, trucks, cars, us, landfills, all the things we do. We're, we're basically a, uh, a fossil fuel economy and we have to shift away from that to a uh, basically an all electric economy that doesn't emit fossil fuels. So that's our, our big problem. And we have to do that in a short period of time. That's why we need this wartime effort that we talked about earlier. But one of the issues that comes up and I think is interesting and several of you have talked to me about this issue and it's that our country's cheating on this business of, uh, of uh, climate change. Are they taking unfair advantage of the US uh, because we're really nice guys and uh, they basically uh, aren't? So let's look at the, the cheating issue and see what you think. We'll go into a little bit of detail on this. This slide shows the emissions worldwide of various countries and their share of the emissions. For example, we see China here is leading the rest of the world at 28% emissions. So they really have a lot now. The US only has 15%, about half of China. India has about 7%, about half of the US. The rest of the world has about 21%. So that gives you some idea where the emissions are coming from today. So we'll examine the US China and India to get some idea of, uh, of which countries are doing what. Uh, here we have uh, wind, for example. Wind is one of the primary ways to uh, eliminate uh, uh, fossil fuel electrical power. And we see here that China is by far leading the pack here with about 36% currently of the, uh, of the world's wind, uh, electrical wind capacity. Uh, the US used to be first in this, but we basically have slipped significantly. So China is really, really doing well. Uh, we basically are at about 16%. So we're a little bit less than half of China. Uh, the Germans are about uh, 9%. And the rest of the world comes up about, uh, about 16%. So basically the rest of the world, the smaller countries, the some of them is equal to what the US is doing. So that's wind. Let's take a look at some other things. This basically shows the, uh, how the, the CO2 has been, been uh, increasing emissions for the last 18 years. That was down here about uh, 25 on these units, uh, gigatons of CO2 per year. 
And basically in uh, 2019, uh, it was up, up to about 37 or so. And the rate for the past uh, uh, five years has been about 0.8% per year. So it's still going up. We have to have stop that. To compare China and the US, what we see here is that China has basically been uh, they started off at half what the U.S. was at, and they've been emitting a lot of uh, a lot of fossil fuels, and they're, they're leveling off the last few years uh, since the Paris Accords, and they're down to about 0.4 percent per year, but it's still a positive number, whereas the U.S. has been sort of flat and decreasing actually since the Paris Accord. But ne neither country is doing very well. But the China is relatively. Uh, uh, more of an emitter than the U.S. is here. Here's the European Union. They're about about the kind of performance we're showing here. They're going down about 0.8 percent a year. India, a, a country with a lot of people and uh, not a real rich country, is increasing its uh, its uh, fossil fuel emissions by about up to five percent a year. The rest of the world's coming in at about 1.4%. So we have a problem around the whole world, not just with China and the US. We have to do something that basically solves these problems in a way that works worldwide. Are the rules of the game fair? It depends on how you define the rules. And so that's one of the things I want you to think about. For example, some people say that one way to, to be fair about this stuff is to base your, uh, your analysis on the per capita uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So basically you take your emissions and divide by the number of people. If you do that, what you see is the US is declining significantly here. We're currently going down about one and a half percent a year. Whereas China is pretty well flat. A European Union is declining at about 1% a year. India is increasing about 4% a year. So that gives you a feeling for one of the parameters. You could also use a parameter that would be something like uh, how much of the CO2 that's in the air came from which countries. So let's look at China to see how they're doing. Uh, in, move this out of here, in 2019, uh, they built a lot of new electrical capacity. 52% of that new capacity was from solar and wind. So you can see they're pretty serious about building new capacity for solar and wind. But they also have this Neanderthal kind of concept where they're still hanging on to coal. And it's not completely their fault. What I was at a meeting at the, uh, at the World Bank. Uh, we were meeting with the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the vice president who is the executive vice president of the World Bank, uh, Catherine Marshall. And uh, basically, we went over the plans that they had for, uh, for new, new generation. And we informed the World Bank that they didn't really have anything in there other than coal. They were just pushing coal. It was a giant coal machine. And uh, they were shocked at that and didn't believe us. And we went over the details. And by the end of the day, they believed us and that they decided they were going to change their posture to stop uh, being solely a coal machine. So they haven't, they, they, they're part of the world's problem today, but they're on the right side now. This is the US picture. Here you see, basically, we put in 70% of our new capacity in 2019 was from solar and wind. But we also are putting in a lot of natural gas, all this fracking that's going on there, a lot of natural gas. So, and natural gas, as we'll find out in great detail uh, during next talk, uh, is a, a very serious greenhouse gas. Uh, you'll find that it's, uh, it's actually worse than coal if you look at the whole fuel cycle. So the US has a serious problem with natural gas. China had a serious problem with coal. So for a, uh, a tiebreaker on this sort of thing, we can use the uh, Paris Accord as a way to basically keep everyone on the same pl uh, plane. In 2015, the, the, the Paris Agreement occurred where every nation in the world agreed to work together to achieve net zero greenhouse gases by mid-century. This is the second time uh, the world has come together with a environmental agreement about anything. So it's, it's a remarkable thing. But the first agreement was uh, uh, about uh, doing something about the, uh, the hole in the ozone layer. And that's, uh, that's working out. 
but uh, we're, we're basically just learning how to do this one here. So hopefully uh, during the meeting in uh, Glasgow, Scotland, this November, uh, we will have uh, the countries all working together again with the US back in, uh, actually active in this agreement. But there are some key management issues. Let's talk, talk about those. We have to make sure that, this, that what we do makes sense. For example, if we take a look at uh, where does the uh, electricity come from, what we see is that 25% of it comes from uh, making electricity and heat. Uh, about, 20, about the same percentage comes from agriculture and forestry, 14% from transportation, 21% from industry. So how should we reduce these various sectors? Do we do sort of like a one size fits all approach or do we do something different? For example, we could reduce the, uh, uh, the amount of each of these things by the same percentage if we wanted to. And that would look nice and fair, but that might not make any sense. The reason it might not make any sense is it might be a lot cheaper to reduce some segments than it is to reduce other segments. So what you want would, would normally go for is some sort of uh, policy that one of the components of it would be the, the biggest bang for the buck. So we could go with a policy that looked like this. Instead of a one size fits all, we could basically decrease different parts differently. We might decide to go light on industry, but to go heavy on transportation, because this helps solve the smog problems that you have in your cities. Uh, we might go uh, heavy on electrical production and lighter on uh, buildings. So you have to get together and somehow come up with something that uh, you agree upon. And what we're going to talk about today is how do you get the numbers to, to begin to get those agreements together? We're going to use a book called Drawdown, which is the most comprehensive plan uh, ever for taking care of these greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it's available for uh, 15, 20 bucks on Amazon. And it's, it's the best uh, planning uh, book there is for this sort of thing. We'll go into some of the details about it. Some of you have told me that you belong to groups that uh, are involved with Drawdown. So Drawdown shows us basically how to eliminate a thousand gigatons of carbon, which is the amount that we have to eliminate if we're gonna meet the uh, requirements for the Paris Accord. And it also shows us, by the way, how to save $74 trillion while you're doing that. So it's like a win-win kind of thing. You win in terms of money, you make a lot of money. Uh, you also solve the problem that's uh, threatening the survival of humanity on the planet. So well, that's a really good win-win kind of approach. He used terms in there that are kind of interesting. There's like, a, a, what does a gigaton mean, for example? This is a picture of an Olympic sized swimming pool. They're about 50 meters long, 25 meters wide. They have a volume of about 660,000 US gallons. So if we want to get the equivalent of uh, 1,000 gigatons, uh, if we were to fill swimming pools up to that amount, we would take 400 million Olympic sized pools in order to take the, to fill them up with water that would weigh a thousand gigatons. So that gives you a little bit of a talking point to talk to your friends about, about the size of a gigaton. Uh, the, uh, the pool is a, is a good example. In, in doing the work for the drawdown, they have to consider running the plant, which is called the fuel cycle, but they also have to consider building the plant because it takes some energy to build a plant, uh, take some, uh, ingredients, water, uh, cement, so forth. And those can have greenhouse gas emissions. And then whenever the plants through its, uh, its life, you have to spend some energy and time and expense on decommissioning the plant. So what they do in the drawdown book is they go through this complete energy cycle. So their numbers are meaningful for each of the options that they take. So let's go through one example, for example. Let's take land use as one of the areas and one of the uses of land that we have is we can grow bamboo. You know, bamboo in some places will grow like a foot a day. So it's, it's a fast grower. And uh, it turns out that uh, in Drawdown, what they do is they tell you 
uh, how this option, bamboo growing, uh, very, uh, compares to other options. They say this one is number 35 on their list. So that basically says that they're comparing it in terms of gigatons of, car of uh, greenhouse gases reduced. So this is about seven uh, gigatons uh, reduced here. And the cost is also shown about $24 billion net cost. That means the cost to, to build uh, the system. And there, and there's a total cost, which is like the, uh, the, 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 the total savings, which is the difference between the cost of building and running the system uh, compared to the cost of running a fossil fuel equivalent. So this one has a net savings of about uh, $264, billion. So that's the idea. We'll go into some more detail on each of these steps. For example, for electric vehicles, we have the, we'll get the ranking for the vehicle. We'll get some sort of discussion in the book. The, they usually have uh, the ranking, the discussion, and a summary for each of the options. So it's typically about three pages per option. For example, the ranking uh, would, uh, would be, it would show that the ranking of, of these electric vehicles is number 26 on the list. So it's, it's sort of towards the middle of the list. The, there's about 100 uh, or so in the list. And the gigatons reduced is shown over here. The uh, cost to uh, essentially purchase and make the cars is here. And the savings is here, about 9.7 trillion. So that gives you kind of a quick summary. And then there's a discussion that goes along with that. So the CO2 global reductions are about this number here. The net cost is down here. And the savings, that's the operational cost minus the uh, operational cost of the new idea is about uh, roughly 10 trade. So that's, that's the idea of the numbers. Okay, do you have any questions so far? We've done a lot. All right, so a couple of questions. Here's one. Are there other benefits that the EV uh, technology should bring? Well, that's an interesting question because you know, EV basically gives you these cars that uh, essentially don't, don't emit anything. And uh, they're, they're quiet. They, uh, they run nicely. Um, so they, they, uh, they have some other benefits. Like for example, uh, m much of the, uh, the smog, I would say most of the smog in most cities is due to uh, their transportation system. So if you basically take a big slug out of the, the transportation system emissions by uh, using EVs for, for, for regular, regular folks transportation and also for maybe trucks, what happens is you've dropped your emissions very, very significantly and you've essentially eliminated the smog problem of a city. So just as a sort of a free benefit on the side, you, uh, you, you buy a lot of EVs and you, you basically solve your smog problem, which is kind of nice. Uh, you also uh, can do other things with, with, uh, the, uh, with the EVs. You can take a, uh, an EV and basically you can charge it during the day whenever there's a surplus of electricity uh, from uh, solar power plants and basically then store the energy during the day. And you can hook it up in such a way that you can actually drain some of the energy from the EV uh, for, the, for the grid during the evening. So there's a lot of interesting possibilities there. Okay, excellent. And related, uh, Mary Dell is asking, is Tesla or Prius a better choice? What do you think? Well, they're, they're different, uh, first of all. <laughs> you know, the, uh, uh, the Tesla uh, is 100% is electric. Uh, the Prius, basically, uh, they, Toyota has decided not to push electric very hard because they, they've decided they want to go with hydrogen cars. So with hydrogen fuel cycles. So uh, what they do is they basically have a compromise car, which is basically you get a little bit of mileage from the battery, but most of your mileage comes from the, uh, from the gasoline. So if you, if you get a Prius, for example, you might get, uh, let's say, uh, 50 miles out of the battery. Uh, but then again, after you go 50 miles, you shift to the fossil fuels. Whereas uh, 
if you uh, go with a Tesla, uh, you get no fossil fuels. So in terms of, depends how much you travel. If you travel 20 miles a day, uh, there, there would be equivalent. If you travel 60 miles a day, the uh, Prius will basically act like a fossil fuel car for 10 of those miles. And the Prius will, or the uh, Tesla will basically act like a, a fossil fuel free car for, for the whole distance. So that's a, that's a clever question. Good, good one, Mary Dell. <laughs> All right, and then Robert asks, can we talk more about the bamboo example compared to what? Well, that, what you do is you have to compare it with the uh, equivalents uh, that for, for fossil fuels. Like for example, if you were using bamboo for a, uh, uh, a scale uh, for, for people building a building, like uh, an outside the building kind of scale, uh, you'd have to put something else out there. You can put something made of aluminum or wood or uh, maybe steel. So what they would do is they would basically compare the bamboo use with the uh, fossil fuel equivalent, be it steel, aluminum, whatever. So that's the, that's the whole idea. You always have to have a comparison of if you did it with fossil fuels, what would it cost? And, and bamboo is a tricky one because it's like, it's not immediately clear what is the fossil fuel cost, but it would be for like the structure to uh, do that. Okay, great. And then uh, last one, this whole uh, energy cycle idea sounds intriguing. Will we be hearing more about that? Uh, actually, yes. And during the next talk, what we're going to do is basically compare uh, four uh, contenders for uh, generating electricity uh, in, in the world. And, uh, uh, right now, uh, the biggest one is coal, but coal is disappearing, so we're not going to do coal. But we'll basically do uh, natural gas. We'll do uh, uh, solar, wind. Yeah, and we do, we do coal also. So basically, you get some feeling for how they compare. Uh, we're not going to do nuclear during uh, next week. We're saving that for the, uh, uh, the nuclear waste along the beach talk. So you'll, you'll get that a little bit later. Okay, let's look at wind. This shows that uh, global wind capacity was essentially nothing in 1995 and is equivalent to uh, about 350 San Onofre plants. But just to give you some idea, I always like to compare with San Onofre because I know the numbers there. And there's two plants there, so each one is a uh, 1,000 megawatts or, or, or a gigawatt. And so basically, this would be equivalent to uh, seven, 700,000 would be equivalent to uh, um, 350 uh, San Onofre plants. So that's the world equivalent today. Now, in terms of nuclear plants, there aren't that many nuclear plants out there. So uh, basically, this is a lot of, of wind power. Let's look at onshore wind. You can, you can do wind power two places. You can do it in, in the water, or you can do it uh, on the land. This is the price for on the land. You can see the numbers are dropping from about uh, back in the uh, 1984. It was around 200 euros uh, per megawatt hour. And now it's down to about, uh, oh, getting down to, uh, around one euro. So you can see that the price has dropped very significantly. And that's why wind is, is, a, is a big contender. Wind has another advantage too, and that is that if you have a big farm field, and you want to put up some wind tires there, the wind only takes up about 1% of, uh, of the land. So you can have uh, uh, corn being grown under there, or you can have cattle wandering around. So it's, it's a very low land use kind of uh, source. This is a picture of the uh, wind, wind uh, mills out in the Banning Pass. This is, if you go from say Los Angeles, uh, to Palm Springs, you pass the Banning Pass there. And what you see is you see a, a mixture of, uh, of, of windmills there. It looks like a, a forest of windmills. And you see some that are real small, fairly small, and some that are big. What, what's happening is they're taking the small ones out because the small ones used to require uh, about 15 miles an hour wind in order to work, whereas the big ones only require the order of maybe six miles an hour of wind to work. So basically you get a lot more bang for your buck out of the big tires. So you're seeing more and more big ones and less and less little ones. 
And whenever you take out, uh, whenever you put in a big one, you can take out about 50 little ones. So it makes the uh, whole thing look better also. This is gives you some idea of global wind capacity here. We went over this before. Uh, basically, this again is that same picture. This is what, what, what it looks like if you're walking on one of those, uh, those wind tires. Uh, they're, they're giant things. They're uh, you know, typically twice the size of the uh, Statue of Liberty. Or, or bigger than the Eiffel Tower. So they're very big things. And uh, a bigness in this case uh, is interesting. What happens is the bigger they are, the slower the, uh, the blades go around. So if you go to, to the big ones that are in Palm Springs and you basically sit under one of the blades and watch the wind go around, watch the blades go around, it takes about uh, 18 seconds for the blade to go around once. So the old uh, windmills used to go around real fast. So they became uh, sort of like bird chopping machines. So the birds would go through there, they'd get all chopped up into bird burger. And the new ones, basically a bird could land on the, uh, on the, on the, on the blade and, and go around many times until it got dizzy and then go off. So it's much safer in terms of the birds. Let's look at solar. There's two flavors of solar. One flavor is rooftop solar. So this is an example of a rooftop solar system. This is the one that I had in Carlsbad. It's about five kilowatts of, uh, of power and it fits on the roof nicely there. And what it did is it gave me enough electricity to, uh, to run the whole house, to uh, also uh, run my car, charge my car electrically completely with it. So my car uh, fuel became zero. Uh, a lot of my charging after the first uh, four or five years on the, on the roof became zero. So it became a very, very uh, cost effective thing. And we were delighted at, at how good that was. So that works for lots and lots of different folks. There are also big plants being put out here. This is the, the, the big plant capacity here. And what it shows is that essentially back in uh, the year 2005 or so that we essentially didn't have any, any uh, solar capacity. And now we're up to, uh, in the US, about 75 uh, gigawatts. The reason for it becoming so popular is simple, that the cost of these solar cells, the uh, silicon, uh, stuff that's with, that makes the electricity, uh, basically used to be about $80 a watt back in around 76. And, the, and they only were used for spacecraft then because it was just too expensive. So now it's down to about 25 cents a watt and the price is still dropping dramatically. So price, price is causing this to become the leading contender for uh, new electrical energy. We talked about China a little bit earlier. This is a big uh, Chinese uh, solar plant in China. It's, uh, it's the world's largest solar array now. I think it's 1.7 uh, gigawatts. So it's equivalent to uh, a one uh, cent and over. China has become the, uh, the dominant supplier of solar uh, materials. So it's really great for their economy. I hope we get back to where we used to be where we were the supplier of, of solar. In the US, there are nearly five times as many jobs in solar as there are in coal mining. If you go to a coal mining plant, you see it's just all big machines. The machines are dwarf the size of people, they're maybe 10 times the size of a person. So what happens is there, there aren't many jobs there anymore because the, the, it's not because of the, the amount of coal that's produced, it's because of the machinery that's used. So it's basically not a labor intensive kind of thing. So if you want a job, get involved in solar. So in the last five years, this is based on 2019, the US solar energy jobs have grown by a factor of six faster than the overall economy. So it's really a good investment for the country. Okay, some more questions. So uh, Marion just put a comment in that on the uh, blades of the, uh, of the, I think the, the painting, one of the blades black helps prevent bird strikes. Have you heard that one? Uh, 
Uh, no, I haven't. That's an interesting <laughs> idea. You know, I, uh, I've heard of, of putting uh, uh, various kind of like little, little bird making sounds on them to basically scare the birds away, like put a, a hawk sound on them to uh, make the birds think there's a hawk there. But I've never heard about the uh, black. Uh, maybe Marion can, uh, maybe during the, the free for all Q&A session at the end, maybe Marion can make some comments on that as to, as to why that would make a difference. That's very clever. I think there's a, a heck of a lot of room for creativity uh, in, in this business. Okay. If you, want, then, if, you want to, if you want to get an idea about uh, uh, wind, uh, go, to, go to Palm Springs and uh, there's a, uh, there are various tours there. There's one that's given by one of the uh, uh, one of the Indian casinos, and that's supposed to be the best tour. I've been on that one maybe three, four times, and it just uh, it got really. It takes uh, you get real insight. I mean, you really go up there right near them, and he talks about the old ones, the new ones, and and what works and what doesn't work. So uh, it's uh, it's a fascinating thing to see. Okay, and then kind of a related question is what are, what are the advantages of the offshore wind um, engines? Well, the uh, offshore, the uh, idea there is that you can uh, basically not use up land at all. You, you're losing up uh, basically lake space or, or sea space. Uh, and uh, so land use is, is certainly different. Uh, it also, it has advantage of if you wanted to, say, uh, build a big power plant near LA, you could build the power plant fairly close you know, go offshore a mile or two, build it there, as a, and so you have a very small transmission line instead of a big transmission line going uh, to the desert. So uh, that, that's one of the reasons why uh, offshore is becoming popular in many places. You can just put the, put the, you know, the windmills near where the people are. Yep. But, you, but the, usually they like them far enough away so they look pretty small. <laughs> okay, and then... Um... Randy's asking, um, what about the um, energy storage to deal with the less than 24 hour production of solar and wind? Are there any good ideas that are cost effective there? Well, let's, let's, let's talk about solar first uh, by itself. Uh, solar does fine uh, in, the, in, the, in the daytime. It doesn't do too well at night. <laughs> now, there are some solar plants that basically don't follow that rule. What they do is they uh, essentially take some of the energy uh, from the plant, from the, uh, uh, the solar plant, and they uh, reflect that energy by mirrors uh, onto a, uh, a big uh, storage chamber on the top of a tall tire. And that tire will contain something like molten salt or something like that. And so what they can do is they can actually store the heat uh, during the day in that salt, and perhaps you'd like the one at uh, Ivanpah, which is on, on the way to Palm uh, Springs uh, around Route 15. Uh, the Ivanpah thing looks like a, a bunch of big uh, mirrors in the desert, big circular geometry with a big tire in the center. And uh, what they do is they basically take some of that heat, uh, energy from the, from the light, and they store it as, uh, as heat. And so whenever the sun goes down, they run it as a, a normal thermal power plant. And they can run it for about eight hours. So that's one way to do it. Uh, there are some issues about that. Uh, one of the big issues is the, with, with the Ivanpah plant is that they didn't think too much about birds getting in the way of those concentrated sunbeams. And so they have a problem with what they call smokers. You have a bird that goes through there and catches on fire. So they have to figure out some way to basically eliminate the smokers and hopefully they're making progress in that. So that gives you a, a good idea about that. Excellent. And then Sarah has a good question um, that says, because making solar energy arrays and wind turbines uses natural resources, materials, what materials might be rate limiting now and what could, be, what could, what could we run out of in the future? Well, you always have to do with, with any technology, you know, if you're going to use a lot of it, you have to answer that question for the, uh, for the technology. Like, uh, uh, for example, in, uh, let's see, what is it? Niobium is used uh, in, in part of electric cars, I believe it is. 
And so you have to basically uh, do a survey of where can you get niobium, okay? And usually for funny materials that aren't being used a lot like that, there's, there are limited sources. So then you get into, okay, uh, suppose we decide to use that in a serious way. Could we develop other sources of niobium, like in the US, for example? And so what you want to do is you want to, uh, from a security point of view, you want to have some, most of the materials that you need uh, to be uh, available from your own, own sources that you can protect. So that's a, that's a great question. Uh, in, in terms of most of the material, for example, solar, it's basically a, a form of, uh, of, of silicon dioxide or, or sand. Uh, they, they wouldn't use the beach kind of sand because there's too much contaminants in there, but they would use, you know, a, a basically a cliff kind of sand. It's places where the uh, uh, silicon dioxide would, would grow as like a, a quartz-like material. So you wouldn't have as many, as many impurities. So there's a heck of a lot of that. So well, I don't think we have a problem for that at all. That was a, that was a, a limiting problem with uh, nuclear power for a while. They were worried about uh, running out of enriched uh, the uh, uranium Q235. Okay, and then uh, here's another one. Are there any waste disposal problems with old solar panels? Uh, basically, uh, there's very little trace ingredients in there. So I think the trace ingredients issue isn't uh, that big. Uh, what you also have with those uh, used solar panels, this panel is typically uh, rated for about 25 years. So after that 25 years, it's, it's, it's not producing, I think the number is not, it only produces like 85% or so of the electricity that it produced when it was newer. So what you can do is you can take that stuff and basically sell, it, sell those panels to some uh, uh, organizations that basically uh, uh, can need cheaper electricity. So you sell them to them and they make the electricity cheap and they don't care that it's not as efficient. So there's a good sort of used panel market there. But when you're done, uh, the, uh, the ingredients are basically silicon dioxide. So you basically are talking about uh, going back to sand. Okay, excellent. Um, and then just uh, lastly, Marion posted an article in the chat on uh, painting one of the turbines, uh, the blades black. Uh, and that's okay, over. Uh, we can discuss that. that and, uh, yeah, if anybody wants to check that out, just check the chat and you can, you can have it. All right, okay. I think we're ready to go. Clever idea. <laughs> okay, so we're ready for the next one. Okay, let's talk about electric vehicles, EVs. I, I didn't have a chance to update this slide, so I apologize. These are the old numbers. Uh, this Tesla, uh, the, the cheap Tesla, is about uh, 250 miles now. Uh, the more expensive one, I think, is 320 miles, something like that. So it depends on, uh, on your bank account. Um, Tesla is, uh, is not ranked high in terms of reliability, but it's ranked right at the top of, of owner satisfaction. People love their Teslas. Uh, what I did uh, when I got started in uh, this, I had a Volt, and it had a range of a battery range of about 53 miles. I've since got myself a Bolt, B-O-L-T, and it has a battery range of about 250 miles, and I'm delighted with it. Uh, I, th I think that in terms of cost effectiveness, it's probably uh, there. This is the Prius we talked about earlier when Mary Dell asked a question. Basically, it had a, uh, um, a battery range of about 53 miles, and then it would shift to a gasoline-powered uh, car. And this is a Leaf. Uh, the newer ones have about 220 miles or so. Uh, range with the battery. So uh, nice cars. Uh, it, what, we'll what we'll find out is that the thinking of the auto companies has shifted. They basically thought that cars were something like uh, fancy golf carts. And so they didn't worry too much about charging the cars, <laughs> you know, because they didn't think of people going very far. But we don't think of cars that way. We think of them as a, a vehicle to take us from point A to point B. So there's giant expansion in the charging capabilities. And the new chargers, for example, I, I go to the San Diego uh, Transit Center to charge my, uh, my Bolt, and I think there's eight or so fast chargers. So I've, I'm basically there for an hour or so for a complete charge. 
So it's uh, it's not too terrible. I, what I do is I go to the uh, Mexican restaurant across the street and have myself a cup of coffee and come back and I'm done. So uh, EVs look like wonderful options. And a lot of countries agree that these are wonderful options. In fact, they're, they're, they're setting rules for uh, phasing out uh, these cars, like Norway is gonna start phasing them out in 2025. Uh, India, it turns out about 2030. Sweden, around 2030. What they do in Sweden is they are phasing out the fossil fuel cars, but they're also putting a tax on people bringing their cars downtown. And so what happens is much of uh, uh, what they call Gablestan, it's the old town part of, uh, of, of Stockholm, uh, you can now walk around there without taking your life in your hands with the cars. So it's, uh, it's really improving the quality of life. So, so what's happening is all around the world, uh, they're basically going this way. This is why it's, it's sort of foolish for the US to fuss around over auto car mileage standards because everyone is going to want uh, electric cars. And so if you don't produce uh, those cars with their, uh, you know, their rating would be like 120 miles or so equivalent, uh, uh, that what with that, with that, with that, that does is put you out of the car business. So if you want to be in the car business, you have to basically uh, go electric. And a lot of uh, countries or companies believe that. Uh, for example, General Motors, is saying that it's uh, it, the future is all electric. So they're going to do that. This is the kind of material you get from Drawdown. It would say electric vehicles are in this list of 100 or so options ranked as number 26. And that means that you have about 10.8 gigatons reduction in CO2. The cost of, of building this system of, of electrical cars, the numbers that they pr project, would be about 14 trillion. The net savings means the cost of producing those minus the cost of uh, producing the uh, uh, fossil fuel equivalent is, is close to $10 trillion. So this says it's $10 trillion cheaper to go uh, all electric than it is to stick with fossil fuels. So even if you didn't have a, uh, uh, a climate change problem, uh, you'd be foolish not to do this because it's much more in, to your advantage. So that's the kind of stuff you get from Jada. Very nice uh, book. Uh, several people I've talked to in the group are uh, becoming members of drawdown organizations where they exa examine these things in details. And I highly recommend the book to you. Like I say, it's 15, 20 bucks on Amazon and it's, uh, it's the most comprehensive list of uh, how to reduce uh, the greenhouse gas emissions in terms of uh, all the variables like cause. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, food here. Basically, what happens here is that you can save a lot of money, a lot of gigatons by various options to re, uh, for food. But the problem that they have at Drawdown is that given their methodology, they can't figure out how to estimate the cost of it. So there needs to be uh, like a second Drawdown book where they use a more advanced uh, uh, methodology where they can handle things that have a a highly variable cost. So they're they're working on it, and I don't know where they are. Maybe someone during the, uh, the Q and A period has an idea of where they are on that. But I think that's uh, something that needs to be plugged. So in terms of opportunity, it's rated number four, but uh, you don't know what you're paying for that opportunity. So it's not really a good one to use. Okay, let's go into the conclusions here. Can we win the war on climate change? Well. That, that's what they say in engineering. The question is, the best answer is, it all depends. <laughs> so yeah, we can win it, but only if we take effective action. So we should be, hopefully you're motivated so far to take action. You have a better idea after today of what kind of actions you can take, but we have to take those actions. So a few examples. Uh, wind, basically, we've shown that you can save about 84 uh, gigatons there at a savings of uh, uh, seven trillion. 
electric vehicles save about 10.8 gigatons. And the savings again, nine trillion. Big savings. Uh, food, we don't know the savings. Rooftop solar, this. If we add on the uh, uh, the, the farm solar, well, we come up with about uh, 80 gigatons here and with about nine or so a trillion here. So basically this afternoon, we're, the, we're showing you how to save so far about 186 gigatons uh, at a, at a uh, savings of about $20 trillion. So if we had a little bit more time, we could uh, get all the way to the <laughs> Paris Accord. So we've basically gotten to a significant percentage, about 20% of our goal today. So you can see this is a very, very effective way to begin to understand these issues. So this is the kind of spreadsheet that, uh, that's available uh, uh, through Drawdown. And so basically you have all this data on the spreadsheet and you can slice and dice it any way you like uh, in order to come up with the results that you came up with. Like for example, I just took all their data, added it up, so we can save the 1,000 gigatons that we want for the Paris Accords. And we end up saving about $74 trillion. So not a bad uh, exercise, a good way to look at the problems. And we also uh, save the earth as a habitable place for us to live. So the big question is, can we change fast enough? That's a good question. This, you might take an analogy here. This is the Starship Enterprise. And if we get up to warp speed, we might be able to move fast enough. So I think we can move fast enough in this area. Uh, let's give some examples here. Back in, way in the dark distant past of 2014, the uh, electricity from solar and wind was cheaper than new coal plants, new, new coal and natural gas plants in only 1% of the world. So 1% is a good deal, the rest of the world, not such a good deal. That's 2014. Let's go jump into the, closer to the present, 2019. Five years later, solar and wind are the cheapest sources of new electricity in two thirds of the world. So in five years, we've gone from 1% to two thirds of the world. And we're projecting, if we go to 24, uh, 2024, that we have the cheapest, that these, these wind and solar are the cheapest sources of energy over the entire world. So that's clearly on our side, that uh, people are gonna need more and more electricity because everything is going towards electricity, like the cars, you have to have them plug into something to get the electricity. So, and if, if wind and solar are the cheapest, then that they're the ones that are gonna win the game and the other ones are gonna phase out. So, what we have to do is make sure the other ones phase out in a way that uh, is fair, but in a way that also uh, accomplishes our goals to uh, keep us all alive. I'll give you some more examples here. This is uh, uh, for the LED lights. What we see back in the dim dark past of 2010, that 1% of the lights uh, were LED. By 2015, it got to about 26%. By 2020, it's estimated to be uh, somewhere around, say, 70%. And by 2025, they're saying LED is going to capture 95% of the market. So if you can see how these things change. It's like telephones. Uh, you don't see any of those old telephones anymore. Everybody has a cell phone. So things can change rapidly if they make economic sense. In making these changes uh, to renewables, we basically have a lot of people working uh, on renewables. So in, in 2019, we had 11 million people working on renewables. So that's a good source of jobs. Okay, you may have a few questions now and hopefully we can get back to some of those questions that we didn't quite answer earlier. Yeah, well, there's uh, uh, several comments here about uh, uh, the book Drawdown. Uh, Rody had mentioned that, you know, rather than buying the three-year-old book, you can just go online and stay current on it. And then uh, Marion actually posted the link to it uh, in the chat. So if anybody's interested, and then 
Katya says that in her library, there is actually a app that you can get called Hoopla for digital books uh, that has the audio version of Drawdown. So all good suggestions. Oh, great. To stay current on, uh, on Drawdown. Super. What about freight trucks on diesel? Can a truck be built with batteries for long distance? Uh, the, the answer is yes. Uh, but the question is, how soon? So what's happening is, uh, I think the answer now is that some trucks can be built uh, that are smaller trucks, and that as they, uh, you know, improve the marketing and improve the uh, battery capabilities, they can uh, be done quicker and quicker. I don't have available the uh, projection curves for trucks. Maybe someone in the audience has that. And Charles just says that uh, he understands GM plans to phase out of gas and diesel cars by 2035. Yes, it's 36. Okay. And they'll probably end up doing it sooner because what they're, what they're finding out is that uh, the, uh, the cars are more reliable, people like them, uh, they're easier to sell. So I think that as you, uh, as you start to take seriously the need for having more chargers on, on, on long freeways, <laughs> Yep. That, uh, what will happen is you'll, you'll see a big explosion in that field. In that market, yeah. And then Sarah um, says, these are all rational changes that society needs to make. Please comment on the necessary role of a carbon tax on driving manufacturers to make these choices in time of, in times to abate climate disasters. Okay, well, let's go back a little bit on the, the, the discussion of what is a carbon tax. So, Basically, during the, uh, the Nixon administration, there was a proposal to put a tax on sulfur dioxide because there's a lot of uh, sulfur coming from uh, all sorts of uh, plants uh, around the world, especially in the US. And it turned out that the, the tax wouldn't have to be real high and the, uh, uh, the effect would be very quick. And so what happened is the uh, staffers in the, uh, in the Nixon administration basically killed the idea because they didn't like the idea of it being so easy to implement and being so effective. So what we did with uh, uh, things like uh, acid rain is we basically still didn't really ever get back to the, uh, you know, just tax the thing itself. We basically decided to have some sort of accounting scheme where we would uh, allow people to trade credits, emission credits. So if you could build, put some gizmo on your plant and it would decrease your sulfur or NOx, nitric oxide emissions by a certain amount, you could then sell that decrease to someone else. So this was called cap and trade. There was a cap there. And if you had, uh, if you were below the, your particular cap, you could sell the difference to your your friends and neighbors. And that, that works, but the problem is it's very bureaucratic, very, uh, very intensive in terms of a lot of labor to keep track of all the stuff and very slow to make progress. So currently California is, is sort of stuck with that. And hopefully we'll have the wisdom to go with a more effective technique, which would be something like um, putting a tax on the carbon itself, which is the, the concept of, uh, of uh, Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, Marshall Saunders came up with the idea that, that if we put that tax directly on uh, the pounds of gasoline produced, the pounds of uh, oil produced, the pounds of coal produced, the pounds of natural gas produced, a different amount for each, in, each ingredient, what would happen is uh, that would basically uh, bring in a lot of money. And it would cause uh, the price of those uh, fuels to go up. So what that would do is cause the demand for those fuels to go down. And what they proposed to do in order to make this whole thing uh, palatable to the rest of the country was to basically take all the money, is what Marshall wanted to do, and uh, give it back to the people in terms of the tax rebate. So that would be something that could be done very quickly and uh, could be very popular. It turned out that something like 75% of the people would actually gain money uh, through that process. 
Uh, the other 25%, they, they would be like energy hogs. They would pay uh, a premium for that, uh, that privilege of being an energy hog. And it turned out that it was a very effective and very quick way of working. It would solve a lot of the problems. So we, it's something I believe that we certainly should do. I, I'd appreciate any comments that anybody has is uh, with the uh, citizens climate lobby. Um, Rody just makes a comment that the, the dealers, the auto dealers haven't been very good on selling EVs. They don't get the maintenance work they want. Volvo is only selling their EVs online. Well, it's a, you know, it's, it's a way that we do business. And uh, this thing doesn't fit uh, completely into the old way of doing business. So uh, it's a matter of uh, they're going to have to figure out, because uh, there's a lot more of them coming up the pike. So they're going to have to figure out some way to uh, to make a profit uh, and uh, continue uh, with a product that's sellable. L little little bit of a survival of the fittest kind of concept there. Mm -hmm. And remember, too, next Thursday we're going to be talking about energy futures. Yeah, so we're we're going to go through basically uh, how how do you sensibly compare. Uh, a coal power plant with a natural gas power plant with a, uh, a solar plant and a, uh, uh, a wind, wind uh, plant. How do you compare those, including building the plant, getting all the stuff to operate it, operating it, and disposing of all the stuff at the end? You know, uh, we, you'll see when we get to the nuclear thing that uh, nuclear is claimed to be a, a, a very, uh, small land use sort of technology. But if you consider land use as uh, the acreage needed and the number of years needed, and you consider you're gonna have to keep that waste <laughs> somewhere for a long, long period of time, all of a sudden nuclear looks by far the worst in terms of land use utilization. But we'll, we'll go into great detail on that next time. So any more questions? Would a forestation work well for other countries? Okay, uh, we didn't really get into the afforestation issue, uh, but al along with uh, the, the food area, you could consider uh, something to do with land use like trees. And uh, the, uh, if you go through the drawdown numbers for uh, this, this, it's called afforestation, which means taking an area that used to be a forest uh, 20 or more years ago and converting it back into, uh, into a forest. It turns out that uh, the uh, economics of that are quite favorable. I think it's somewhere around number 20 or so in terms of, uh, of the drawdown list and the numbers are big. I first became involved in that whenever I was taking a tour of uh, Northern Mexico. And uh, the guy who was leading the tour was the, uh, uh, I guess he was called the uh, head forester for Sur and Baja, uh, California. <laughs> so basically he had a big slice of, of the land in Mexico. And they, they, were, they took me in this one area, which looked like a big empty field. Uh, it looked like there wasn't any water there, uh, flat. And they had these guys in black shirts uh, planting these real small seedling things, seeds or plants about maybe six inches high. And so I, I first of all said, well, who are those guys in the black shirts? <laughs> and they said, oh, they're from the army. I said, huh? You have guys in the army planting those little seed, little plants? And they said, yeah, that uh, in Mexico, uh, forest and uh, and, and water are considered as part of the national security apparatus. And so the army is out there planting these little mesquite trees. So I said, well, well, those things, uh, how, how are you gonna keep them alive? It doesn't look like there's any water here. He said, oh, we have to, uh, we have to water them for about uh, a few months. And I says, well, where do you get the water from there? He says, well, it turns out the groundwater table is about down one foot. <laughs> So if you can keep them alive where the roots get down to the groundwater table, they'll do fine. And I'm there like, oh, I don't believe it. So they said, well, look, we'll take you to two forests, one that was planted five years ago and one that was planted uh, 10 years ago. So we go to the forest that's uh, five years old 
And there's these trees, I guess they're maybe 10 feet tall, something like that. And, uh, you know, there are all kind of cows underneath the trees keeping cool because of the shade. And it was a you know, very nice, successful field. Then they took me to the one that was uh, planted earlier. And the trees were very, you know, full scale trees then. And it just looked like a beautiful forest. So the head forester was telling me that his grandfather was responsible for destroying the forest of Mexico. And so he decided to take to devote his life to undoing uh, the bad work of his grandfather. Here's a, here's a just question about car batteries. Um, is there any other use for them? Well, batteries uh, are, uh, can be used for a lot of things. So like I think I was mentioning earlier, what you can do is take the, uh, the battery uh, power or the battery energy uh, and store it during the day. That's the time whenever you, you have a surplus of electrical energy from say the solar power. Of course, during night, you don't have any, any energy from solar power unless you put storage in there. And what you do is you can use this uh, energy that's stored in the, uh, in the, in the uh, electric vehicles uh, during the evening, if you like. So basically, it's a very nice scheme for load leveling. Uh, a lot of people worry about the issue of uh, if you have uh, a, a set of different ways of making electricity, how do you match the, uh, the production to the, uh, to the need? And what we normally do these days is we use uh, natural gas peaking plants to basically make up the difference. So if you're gonna get rid of natural gas, you know, those peaking plants are gonna go. And so you have to have some other way. So a good way to do it would be uh, with, uh, with uh, batteries. I'll uh, basically bring in some slides during one of the talks where we talk about the, uh, the shape of the curve that's needed for uh, uh, energy production by uh, like, like this city and uh, the shape that, of the curve that's available and if you compare those curves over time, what you call, you produce a thing that's called the uh, duck curve. So we'll introduce you to the duck curve. And uh, there'll be a section of that introduction that basically talks about how do you make a duck fly? <laughs> so how do you make a, uh, a system that's composed of things that are intermittent act as if they uh, act as if they're base load? So I guess uh, I, I'm kind of negative by nature. So. I, I always think uh, fossil fuel companies provide the cheapest, you know, you can, you know, get in on this. They provide a lot of cheap energy. And, you know, I see things like the UN releasing a report that says like by uh, 10 years from now, there'll be a 0.8% a decrease in the overall CO2 or something. And I'm just thinking, okay, if we want to make these cars run, on uh, the right kind of generation, uh, you know, uh, do you have to nationalize the the uh, the electric companies? You know, I mean, there's just got to be a, a reset in the the whole energy sector, or they're just going to game it. You know, what 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 would happen if we just had all these wonderful electric cars and hydrogen, and it was still all coming from oil? You know, I mean, you know, it. it what would what would make them shift their business model? Would would it be that maybe uh, the big investment firms like BlackRock and those guys would say, "Oh, please regulate us. It's good for us. Finally, we want to be regulated." I, I think there's a there's a simple answer to that uh, that question, Rob, and that is the, the the thing that can drive many many companies is simply greed. But if you can show them you can make a hell of a lot more money uh, by shifting to uh, uh, an economy that's essentially all electric, then the smart guys will basically start getting out. And they're already getting out. Uh, that's why coal is dropping really quickly. And uh, no one's building uh, in this country, building any, any coal plants. And the Chinese and the Indians are figuring out how can we cancel uh, the uh, coal operations as quickly as possible. What I'll do is I'll bring in some, uh, some data that shows you how uh, people are already canceling uh, uh, thousands of coal plants. And uh, the reason they're canceling them is because it's just a heck of a lot cheaper uh, to uh, make the same kind of electricity with, uh, 
uh, wind and solar. So you don't have to be a good guy to uh, to right, recognize right. what can how you can make money. Right, and uh, is it is it uh, not the right question to ask? It, will it ever be expensive to run all this off of natural gas? So, so basically, solar and wind would just have to whip the life out of gas. Well, right, right, right now, it's it's cheaper to uh, for there's a contract led uh, by L.A. Power and Water about a year ago. Uh, and they didn't care what the stuff, what the electricity was made from. They couldn't care less. And mm -hmm. uh, basically, the uh, competitors ended up to be uh, 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 natural gas and uh, basically solar with some electrical storage. And it turned out that they could meet the specs that LA Power and Water wanted with solar plus storage at something like a 30% cheaper cost than the cost of putting in natural gas. And so the uh, solar guys plus battery uh, affiliates won the contract. That's what's happening. So it's, it's, it's uh, replacing uh, the infrastructure with new gas plants that won't happen is where the optimism would be. Well, that, that's, that's part of it. And then, then you get into a secondary question of, uh, okay, if the plants wore out, we have to replace it with something, okay, so we, so we put the new stuff in there, okay? Mm -hmm. that, that's one view. But suppose you have a, uh, a plant that's working perfectly, and I'll give you some examples of that uh, in, in this uh, later talk. Uh, yeah. yeah. Basically, and suppose it's, it costs you so much to produce electricity, okay? Now, suppose you can build a new plant with technology X, whatever it is, uh, that produces the same amount of electricity at half the price. Show it to me. That sounds great. So really what, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Yeah, well, I mean, it makes sense. Then get rid of the old one that's costing you and put in the new one that's going to be cheaper. Exactly. I mean, that's that. So, so you don't have to have any divine inspiration here, uh, Bob. Rob, it basically is that uh, if you see something that you can make a lot more money at, you do it. I got a call uh, from uh, Duke uh, Energy today, uh, mm -hmm. and and it went like this: Duke Energy Progress. So she said, "Do you want to sign up for the Green Advantage Plan?" I go, "What's that?" She says, well, if you pay $9 a month extra over your, your regular bill, um, you know, basically we'll source your power from uh, renewables. And, and then so I said, well, what's the mix in the renewables? And she said, well, 5% of it could come from biomass or whatever you know, agricultural, maybe animal land waste, uh, wood pellets. I was pressing her on that. But she said it was only 5%. The rest of it, I guess, was, you know, the other stuff that's renewable. So I said, well, uh, send me the email. I'll think about it. So okay. I thought that was an interesting phone call. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that, you know, these guys want to make money. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. This is a good way for them to do it. Uh, I think that this is the kind of conversation I would have expected to, to have heard 10 years ago. Uh, not, nowadays, they're getting more clever than that. And they're basically doing what's called time of use uh, oh, yeah. marketing. Some of you maybe signed up for time of use. You know, basically, it's like if you, if you basically uh, use energy uh, during the time that they have a whole lot of it to waste, okay? then you can buy that energy cheap then. Whereas if you use energy at a time when they don't have enough, uh, they charge you more. So that's, that's the, the new thing that basically is making a lot of money for these guys. And, that, well, and that's where, 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 where the regulations are going. Mm -hmm. We have um, two questions in here, Tom. One's related to uh, what we've been talking about on, on wind and then uh, Susan's asking uh, a question on nuclear that I know we're going to talk about nuclear in two weeks, but maybe we can comment on that uh, on her question as well. But the one on wind, Charles says, one downside for wind is disposal of used blades and materials due to age. Can we overcome this? 
I don't. I haven't done any any uh, examination of the the used blade market. <laughs> you know, I don't have any idea of what what you could do with a used blade. But I would think that if you have enough used blades around there, got to be something. Some, some clever person is going to figure out a way to make kayaks or something out of them. I don't know what what you can make out of them. You know. Uh, but uh, you know, if usually if there's a a big surplus of some cheap material that they can do something with uh, that people figure out a way to do it. Can okay. those uh, lithium batteries in the cars be recycled? Well, uh, the, the recycling market in cars uh, works the, is the following. What you do is uh, the batteries basically become uh, inefficient enough where they're not good for the car anymore. Okay, you pick some number, the efficiencies drop by 20% or whatever, right. and you say, oh, that's not good for the car. So what we'll do is we'll basically take those batteries out. They don't give them away. They basically sell them on a secondary market where somebody else has enough space or whatever. To, they, can, they can buy the batteries that are 20% less, uh, less energy uh, for a lot cheaper money. So that does it for a while. Now, at some point, you know, you kind of run out of steam. And then you have to do the uh, end life cycle where you basically try to decide, well, what do I do with what's left? And uh, there are analysis uh, that are called uh, uh, complete life cycle analysis. And I'll be introducing you to that concept uh, next week. So you'll know how to do it, but I, I won't have it probably for batteries because I'm gonna focus on the, uh, you know, the, the four competitors for electricity, uh, basically coal, uh, Nuke, no, not, not nuke, coal, natural gas, wind, and solar. And we'll do nuke the week after that. But I'll be happy to, uh, to uh, maybe do an introduction to the nuke, Susan, if you want to have a question. This, so the question is Bill Gates is supporting some R&D for nuclear technology without all the waste, you know, et cetera, that's been a problem. Um, and it's hard for those of us who are so opposed to nuclear, like San Onofre, <laughs> to believe that. You know, I'm assuming you're probably going to address that in the uh, in the discussion in two weeks. But do, do you want to comment on that? And I know this is something that's uh, near and dear to both of both of our hearts as well. I was just on a, a call this morning with the uh, task force that uh, the Congressman Mike Levin had formed to deal with the uh, San Onofre. Um, so we had another uh, update uh, this morning. So you want to comment on that at all? Well, yeah, I'll be happy to. I've been. Uh... I've been fascinated by Gates's position on nuclear, so I've been listening to his what he has to say for uh, the last maybe three weeks, and I've I bought his book, you know, and his his position is interesting. He basically says that uh, there are big problems with current nuclear technology. Uh, you know, it's dangerous. You know, witness uh, Fukushima. Uh, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island. Uh, there's a, a Russian place that no one talks about where the whole city went, went the race, got a race from the map, essentially. Uh, so he says it's dangerous. And the waste problem, uh, they, they haven't made much progress. I, I spent uh, about a year working for President uh, Carter's science advisor on how to fix the nuclear waste problem. So I'm familiar with it, but they haven't made a whole lot of progress since. So uh, basically, there's a so Gates would say there is a serious problem with current uh, nuclear technology. Uh, the economists that you talk to would basically argue that oh, like maybe three fourths or more of the uh, current nuclear plants are not economically feasible. In other words, you could take those plants, stop using them, and replace them by say wind or solar or whatever, batteries. Uh, and basically it'd be cheaper to do that than to continue running like three fourths of the, of the nuclear power plants in the US. So that's the current stuff. Okay, now the answer to a maiden's prayer is Gates has this new thing, okay? And I've been reading his new thing and I frankly don't understand it yet. Uh, what I did is I, I thought he was uh, going to be uh, using some variation of a, of a nuclear fuel cycle that I had in my library. I have 
like 17 different variations on a theme of nuclear fuel cycles, uh, you know, all kinds of things. Uh, uh, things that, that, that uh, convert the uh, uranium to plutonium, things that, that they work on thorium, all kinds of things. And, and he has a thing called a traveling wave reactor. Now I've read, I've read three or four of his things, okay? And I don't have a clue, you know, being a former specialist in this area, what a traveling wave reactor is. So what I'm, I'm going to doing is I'm basically talking to some of my buddies who hopefully will know, and they can educate me, hopefully by the time of the, uh, the nuclear talk I'm going to be giving you, about what in the heck is a traveling wave reactor? And could you build one? <laughs> And if you build one, would it would it behave anything like the uh, the stuff that they're marketing? So those are some to dos that are on my list. So I don't really know the answer, but I do share your anxiety, Susan, about uh, essentially people around nuclear power plants. And I think there's like 65 sites across the country being held hostage to the nuclear waste. I think that's uh, that's unacceptable because that stuff is dangerous. I mean, if you have a terrorist fly an airplane into it or something like that, then that's one way it can go. Or a place like San Onofre, just uh, the stupid location where they, uh, the sea level rise, in fact, leaving the sea level where it is, is enough to basically uh, corrode those, those things. So, you know, we, we need to get real on some of these things and uh, hopefully we can do it. Uh, my recommendation simply would be that we Pick some sort of place that's uh, maybe it doesn't work for a hundred thousand years. Maybe it works for ten thousand years because the geologists are, sh are iffy about a hundred thousand years, but they they're ready to go for ten thousand years. Stick it out there, and uh, this way you don't hold sixty-five uh, cities hostage for nuclear waste. I think that's an improvement. So you get ten thousand years, and hopefully, if 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 that doesn't work. Uh, somewhere along the line in the, the middle of that, you can figure out how to do it better. I hope that begins to answer your question. And I, I will add just a, a comment that, you know, we are fortunate uh, to frankly have somebody who's got the environmental background that uh, Congressman Mike Levin has on this point. He's really made it one of his top issues and um, has actually done quite a bit, uh, far more than has ever been accomplished by anybody here before on the issue in Congress, moving along on about eight different recommendations of the 30 or so that were made by the task force report uh, that got issued last year. So if anybody's interested in checking out that task force report, I think you can just get it on uh, Congressman Mike Levin's uh, website. Um, if you can't find it, let me know and, and, and I can point you to it. But there is progress being made. It's slow. It's tough. Uh, there's a lot there. But again, with the new generation, uh, or the new uh, administration coming in, new folks coming in to head up the Department of Energy, we're talking about a whole new uh, uh, um, entity to actually deal with nuclear waste, which we don't have in the country. Uh, things like that, that that need to happen. So there is some hope. Well, thanks everybody again for attending and uh, thank you, Tom, for another awesome session and uh, have a great week. We'll see you next Thursday. Thanks very much, everybody. All right. Goodbye, all.